Welcome to Happy Hour, a Scripts Gone Wild spinoff where we sit down with the folks who help make our reads happen, shoot the shit, see what happens. And uh, with us today uh, is our um, foremost Scripts Gone Wild reader. Uh, he's actually been in more reads than any other human being on planet Earth, Mr. Rico Anderson. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, he's also an actor and has done a lot of cool things, too, but we'll talk about some of that. Uh, <laughs> he, he isn't just known for Scripps Gone Wild. Uh, we should we should make that abundantly clear. But it's great to be included in that known for because... It's, That's right. I mean, it's you're in the pantheon now, sir. You're currently you're currently several several reads ahead of your, your closest competitor. Who's, who's number two? Who, who Aaron LaPlante. Aaron LaPlante. Okay. He's, he's a... He's a close second on he's that? a close second and clark wolf is right behind aaron okay all right so as soon as i start slipping that's when they're gonna try to take the lead huh? uh it's right. gonna be tight for the next few reads between you and aaron <laughs> it's, gonna be, it's gonna be real tight wow, wow. um here's a question I i'm curious because every time we do a live read it seems like the chats are equal parts pro Rico, but also wanting you to get really drunk and possibly die of alcohol poisoning. What do you think that's about? <laughs> I always think that, um, you know, the world is out, is out to get me and in some way, shape or form, this is their uh, way of saying, hey, let's let's kill him with a way that he knows that he won't see coming. No, I don't think that 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 would be that would be evil. Uh, <laughs> they're, 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 they're killing you with liquor because they love you. Yes, yes. As long as it's good liquor. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not the type of person who just goes for anything, although I have been known to just be like, what do you got? All right, let's do it. You know, so. What would you say has been the drunkest you've gotten in one of the reads? I, wow. Because I've done so many, I don't I know. Remember. How do you remember them all? Right. <laughs> um... I don't, I can't answer that question because I honestly don't know. I mean, I've never blacked out or anything, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I don't get to that part. Um, I, I will say this and I say this uh, responsibly. I, 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 it was probably during one of the live readings. Sure. Um, sure. When, when we're at El Cid. Um, Same for now, me. Yeah. And, and when, you know, I, I drive there, but if I know that I'm a little, it's, it's just not safe. I will Uber home in a heartbeat. I don't. I don't play that. I don't try to have the mentality. Oh, I'll make it there. Yeah. You know, make it back home. I'm only ten minutes away. I, you don't do the whole. I drive better when I'm drunk. Yeah. No. That. That's. That's just irresponsible. It's sad and it's. It's just. It's just wrong. So, yeah. I, I. I could safely say that, and I know there were a couple of times that where I did end up, uh, Ubering home. Yeah. So I would have to say it was. I just don't remember which read it was. So yeah. I'll have to say it was probably one of those reads. So. Um, I always find that it's good when people can't remember what happens at the reads. That means the alcohol is doing its job. And that's when the fun uh, yes. <laughs> intensifies. Although I will say you can have fun without alcohol also. I want to absolutely I wanna, I wanna can. Drop, drop that level of responsibility. But hey, you know, it's it's a party. It's for charity. It's for a good, a won a wonderful cause every single time. And, you know, it's it's... You know we're having fun as long as we understand our our limitations and what we're doing hey you know yeah um so I, i'm curious you know i did i did you know i always do this with everybody i talk to i sort of just peruse their imdb okay because that's what it's there for peruse and, is such a um and you have actually a pretty extensive imdb um uh more so than most of the folks i chat with and i'm curious about a few things in the very beginning of your career um, they're all uncredited roles, right. but they're uncredited roles in films that I have a, a, a lot of affinity for, and those would be films like uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer, Getting Even with Dad, and Dangerous Minds. Right. And I'm curious, where were you at during this period? Were you here in L.A.? Or... No, I, I was up in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I'm originally from. And is that uh, where well, all these films were shot? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, I'm a re okay. Let me rephrase that. I'm actually originally from Chicago. I lived as, as a little boy in Chicago, and then uh, when we were 11, um, when I was 11, my mom packed us all and 
uh, we ended up moving to the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, yeah, the, these are all films that were shot in the Bay Area. It, in the 80s and the 90s, it was a huge hub for, for uh, Hollywood films. Um, a lot of productions came up there and, and like Robin Williams shot a big chunk of his stuff there. Eddie Murphy shot some stuff there. I mean, a lot of celebrity. The Bay Area was basically like a second Hollywood. In essence, it was almost like Atla what Atlanta is today. Uh, minus all the uh, all the TV and the Bay Area only had a couple of you know really big shows that really big shows that um, that that were produced up there maybe about four maybe five but film was the big hub and that's that's where a lot of uh, a lot of the work came from yeah so and so that's where you got that's sort of where you got so you got started acting there you is that where you first started acting or did you start earlier yeah. than that? No, you know, I, I've honestly, I've I've wanted to be an actor ever since I was six. I knew that path, and and I and I knew that that was something that I wanted to do because I, I would watch TV just like everybody else, but I would watch it in a way where I'm looking at it and going, I want to do that. That looks like it's so fun, so cool, and I saw representations of myself, black kids, black adults, and but I also noticed that I didn't see a whole lot of us on, on TV. Yeah. Yeah, and even in film, I mean, probably more film than TV, but still, you know, the the representation wasn't as solid as, as it is like today. Um, so I've always wanted to do that, but nothing ever happened really when I was in Chicago. When we moved to the Bay Area, that's when I started taking classes in uh, junior high school. I started, uh, I was deeply heavily uh, involved in theater, and at Berkeley High, where I went, did a lot of musicals, and we did operettas and. Uh, sang in the choir and all that, danced and stuff. And then once I graduated, I actually went to San Francisco State where I majored in theater arts. And I did a lot of independent film, a lot of plays. And my start, my mentality was this. I, I tried to get auditions for, for different roles in what was out there, what was available, even in the films that, that you mentioned. Um, I wasn't able to get those auditions, but I basically wanted to still be on set. I wanted to learn what a Hollywood set was all about. I wanted to know why things work, why these lights were hitting this, that, and the other. I wanted the Hollywood experience. And so all those credit, uncredited roles are basically background work. Yeah. And it, but you know, the, the wonderful thing that I can say about background work was the fact that it was very, um, it was very educational. And it honestly is still to this day, some of the best experiences that I've ever had because I saw those actors who had maybe a couple of lines in, in the movie to the big actors who had all the lines. And I, just, I, and, and, and I knew I wanted to be those actors that had all the lines, but even the actors that had just a couple or just in a couple of scenes, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be in that mix. So I saw what I was doing as a, a, a start to that. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what those were. And, and, and being in those films were a lot of fun. I mean, you know, again, like, so I married an ax murderer. It, we, we shot that, well, my scenes were shot like on the, uh, at the Embarcadero, uh, which is right uh, in San Francisco, basically on the piers and stuff. Yeah. And it was my first time working with a rain machine. And if you look at the movie, I'm the doorman at the diner at, <laughs> at the during during that scene that takes place in the diner and so and again just all these experiences were, were yeah. just wonderful so basically my career started out as far as professionally doing background work and it it started to rise from there which is what i eventually wanted to do because eventually i wanted to move to los angeles uh what year did you move to la i moved to la in 2000 in 2000 okay yeah because you can see you can kind of see that divide where you're doing all this background work and then all of a sudden you're in you're you're doing like television spots yeah yeah well you know i, I moved to la because you know at the time everybody wanted to be a movie star yeah and uh so you know you moved to la to be a movie star and to and to be like all the other actors and actresses that were out there um but as we know the evolution of the business is really more uh tv yeah um, over any or just, just an online content, which is basically considered TV in this respect also. And so I ended up doing a lot more in, in terms of TV. Now I've done a ton of films, but um, the majority of the work I, I would think it's safe to say was really gravitated more towards television. Um, I, 
I know that you are a Star Trek fan. Huge Star yeah. Trek fan. Because, and you've done, and you've gotten the chance to work in some Star Trek projects and on the Orville, which is, you know, yeah. I, I consider it Star, Star Trek adjacent. <laughs> Everybody does. Um, I'm Respect curious, me. were you always a big sci-fi fan? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Oh my God. I, when I was a kid, I mean, I collected comic books. Uh, there were certain TV shows that I watched religiously. Uh, when I was a kid, the, um, the original series was already in reruns, but it was in like those rerun rotations where like, you know how you come home after school and there's like at yep. once upon a time, you know, those block of cartoons that you, that, that they had. So Star Trek was on, on one of those rotations, you know, they would have a different episode every day. Um, again, all in reruns. Um, but then there were shows like Battlestar Galactica, the original. Yeah. Um, Space 1999. And um, gosh, what else? Um, the Hulk. Yeah. And and it just like all these old school sci-fi fantasy type uh, shows, and you know again along with comic books and 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 cartoons and animation and all that, I've always been a fan. And like some of us, as we get older, we grow out of it. Yeah. But then you have a huge conglomerate of fans who no matter how old they are, they're still loving those animation. They're still loving Star Wars, Star Trek, everything, you know? And I was, I, I was, I was, I was one of them. And um, Star Trek was always at the top of the list. Always loved Star Trek. It was excited as, as all hell when I, when, when Next Generation uh, came out and yeah. that, you know, I was like, ooh, new Star Trek. And of course the movies and everything. And, and going back to when I was six, wanting to be an actor was one thing but wanting to be in star trek was a whole other thing and i really wanted in when it came to that yeah so, yeah and that yeah. i mean yeah I, I it's it's funny to me like i i never was a big star trek i mean i was a tng fan so i, I never i yeah. never watched that original series mm -hmm. but i was i was hooked on the next generation mostly because my mother was and uh, that was kind of a gateway in the more i'm still not i would not call myself a huge star trek fan uh, I watched TNG. I watched those films, but um, it's Star Trek. I feel like is a good gateway drug into other sci-fi. It is. It is. Um, you know, it's interesting. You know, you have that whole Star Trek versus Star Wars thing. Yeah. And Star Trek has been around. While Star Trek has been around longer, when Star Wars came out, it took sci-fi to a whole other level. Yeah. Um, but what it did was it helped Star Trek because next thing you know, the fans, um, gosh, it, Star Trek lasted for three seasons. The fans were wanting more Star Trek even after that. And because of their writing campaigns and calling the studios and all of that, this obviously way before the internet and people could send emails and whatnot, um, there were all these campaigns to, to bring it back. And next thing yeah. you know, uh, the mo uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture came out. Yeah. And that was a semi okay hit. But what it did was it said that people still wanted more Star Trek at the end of the day. Yeah. And so that's when it really started to take off more with more movies. And next thing you know, Next Gen came out. And, and then it's just been pretty much going nonstop ever since. It had a small eight year um, uh, sabbatical where nothing was happening. But the great thing about that was that's when the fans really stepped in and a lot of the um, Star Trek actors stepped in and started producing uh, independent uh, Star Trek projects. Yeah. And yeah. that was along the lines of uh, one of the things that I was involved in was the independent Star Trek project, Star Trek Renegades. Yeah. And so that was a beautiful experience because I, I had the opportunity to work with Tim Russ, who played Tuvok on Voyager, who directed it, and yeah. so many other different actors from Star Trek and other sci-fi uh, franchises as well. It was almost like I had the opportunity to work with people that I grew up watching and admiring in the sci-fi realm. And I mean, Herbert Jefferson Jr. from Battlestar Galactica, the original, was in Star Trek Renegades. I had a chance to really talk to him and just kind of chop it up with him and just let him know how much what he did back then how much that meant to me because of the fact that a I was seeing a person of color, um, a black man on a on a huge series. Um, representation matters, and and his representation on that series mattered. Obviously, with people like Nichelle Nichols, yeah. you know, that mattered as well. So, um, 
yeah so that that really helped star trek uh keep it moving along and then the movies came out with jj abrams and now we you know now star trek is back on tv and yeah. three different series i mean it's 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 rolling baby it's it's, it's still moving and grooving yeah i mean it, it it's like you know i i haven't dove into any of the new star trek stuff just because i mean i've, I've heard so many mixed things i think fans seem somewhat divided over it i know I know, like, our friend Clay Keller is a massive Star Trek fan, and he, yeah. you know, and he can't stand Picard. He can't stand, like, <laughs> and, and, but I know people who love it. I know people who hate it. It's like, I mean, yeah. with anything these days, it's so divisive. Um, one thing I want to ask about, because I ask everybody who has ever worked on one of these, I like to ask them about it because I find them fascinating, and those are soap operas. Um, yes. And I think the last person I got to chat with about it was Amanda Wiss, who had been on some early stuff, but what what was your experience like working on those shows and and like so many people that i know who've been on those say that it is such a good teaching tool for yeah. an actor and i'm just curious what your thoughts are on that what your experience was it was very interesting because the experience was almost like you know how you have certain settings on like basically kind of like uh What's the setting where you can press press the button and all of a sudden everything is like you know, rewind? You know, no, not re <laughs> technically that, was that a good I rewind depression. No, that no, I, and I was thinking about it, I was like no, but but actually yeah, that is a good rewind. No, um, but just more like the you know the voice speeds up, and uh, yeah, yeah. To me, soap operas are very much the experience, but slightly sped up some. Um, it was very interesting. My first my first soap opera was Days of Our Lives. And even just getting on set, you could tell it was different. My dressing room was different. My dressing room had a TV that had a pipe. It, it, it piped into um, what was on TV. You could watch anything, but there was a channel that piped into what was happening on set. Yeah. And it could have been them shooting a scene. It could have been just, you know, the setup. But there was always a camera. There was always a camera on in the casting director's office as well. Um, once you got to set, you're getting ready. Yeah. And it's quick. You you may get a couple of takes out. Um, it's very much understood that the heads are probably watching. Yeah. Like literally watching because that whole TV thing with piped into what's going on on set is in their offices as well. Yeah. So basically you don't want to suck. And because they're watching, which y you hopefully won't anyway, but sure. you know, but yeah, but, but that, that's, it was, it was cool. First of all, it was, it was awesome because they were very quick. They were very to the point. You got a couple of takes. I mean, look, if there was a train wreck, obviously you, you go again or whatnot, but it's just understood that you go in there, you do your work um, and you're, you're done. They're very quick. And if you think about it, there's an episode a day. So yeah. They're banging. They gotta bang stuff out. There's no time for like major issues that, uh, you know. But it's it's not it's not canned performances. It's it's. I mean, some people may say because it's soap operas, but um, you know, they're very they're they're very focused. They're very serious, and um, it reminded me of theater without the audience. Also, yeah, I, I, yeah, um, I hear that. I hear that a lot, which sounds fun. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is because you know you obviously have the rehearsal process, and then you're doing it, and then you're shooting it. It's quick. It's to the point. It was different. It was interesting. I like different. I like I like interesting. I like I like the challenge of walking into something that is a little bit different than what you're normally used to, like a movie set or a TV set, or if you're if you're doing television, if it's live in front of a studio audience, that type of thing, uh, which is so much fun. I'm curious. Um how how much I had this conversation with uh, Alex Marshall Brown recently in the one that we did and I, I and I'm curious because she talked a lot about um, the, the way she was the way she as a black woman was typecast in a lot of roles mm -hmm. and weirdly one of those roles she was always typecast in was a police officer and uh, which makes total sense you've got people who, you've got people who are wanting to uh, <clears throat> You know, okay, we're gonna cast a black person as a police officer. Racism solved. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody go home. Yeah, and so I'm curious, have you? How much of that have you found also in in, in the stuff that you've done? Because I do see a lot of stuff on here where you play detectives and you play police officers. 
Dude, let me tell you. And listen, first of all, just a disclaimer, I'm, I'm always grateful for any opportunity to audition and for any roles that are offered to me. But if you want to be successful in this career and do more, you have to grow. Yeah. And the only way you're going to grow is if you, you, you be eventually begin to say no to certain auditions, certain maybe, you know, direct offers and whatnot. Um, I was also brought in a lot as police officer, number one, police officer, number two, detective, bodyguard, yeah. all those things. And I would say yeah, big, maybe half of half of the stuff I ended up auditioning for getting accepting. Because at the end of the day, you also want the credit on sure. on your resume. And if you don't have anything on your on your on your resume, it's good to have that credit to build, especially if it's a a, a TV show that has a huge following. Um, yeah. So it, it's 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 a numbers game. It's a tricky thing because again, if you don't have the credits, it's good to get those credits on there. But once you get to a certain level of, um, hey, I got this really meaty resume you you start to make the decisions at least hopefully you do of not always just going out for the same roles yeah i never thought of getting uh, a police officer role as uh racism solved um but i looked at it as i i fit the type in many uh people's eyes uh, and this is obviously before the Afro. So like the low cut, I would just have that look and, and I didn't really have this. So like clean shave and I look like kind of like the clean cut boy next door type police officer. Yeah. Whatever way you want to look at that. Sure. Um, along with security guard, bodyguard um, and all of that. The issue obviously came from the fact that as I felt like eventually I need to grow in my career, I started wanting to get bigger roles. I wanted to go out for more bigger stuff. I wanted to be considered for bigger and better parts. Look, I'll get cast as a police officer and do seven seasons on a show as a police officer. It, sure. That's what it's all about. Um, but I, you know, I got, I just got to the point where I just didn't want to do the under five police officer anymore. And, um, it, it, it's it's one of those things where it's it's an easy it's an easy it can it can be an easy booking sure and, um again you just want to grow beyond what you've already done and 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 keep it keep it moving higher and bigger and better so. yeah for sure um so the last i know the last couple years um have been some really cool projects and i want to talk about a couple of them and, and the first being um uh and and weird because a couple of these are with different new streaming services because i know you did the truth be told series that apple tv series yes um with the lovely alabama's own octavia spencer <laughs> uh what was that like what was that experience like it, it was it was it was beautiful because it was it was personal in many ways yeah. the show is based on a book by kathleen barber um the original title of truth be told uh, the, the book is actually called are you sleeping um, the TV series was adapted and created by Nichelle Trample Spellman, who is from the Bay Area, like I am. Her husband, Malcolm, is also from the Bay Area. Uh, Malcolm and I went to high school together. Oh, wow. Uh, we have a mutual friend. Well, my cousin is his one of his best friends. And uh, so in essence, we kind of all came up together yeah. in, that, in that respect. So as Nichelle's, uh, Nichelle and um, uh, Malcolm's star was growing, you know, it's always the mentality of, look, if I have the power to put you in some, I'm gonna put you in some. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, some, uh, Nichelle had some success uh, being on uh, a few different TV shows, so did Malcolm, and eventually Truth Be Told came about. And as they were casting up and getting everything ready, um, I was actually in Oregon, shooting a shoot, shooting a horror film, Get Gone, and uh, I got the call that uh, I have an audition for Truth Be Told. I didn't know it was Michelle's show. I almost turned it down. I almost turned it down because we went <laughs> back to the whole under five mentality and not yeah. wanted to, you know, being considered for for bigger roles. It it wasn't it wasn't that. But what I didn't know was it 
A, I didn't know it was Nichelle show. B, I didn't know that it was it was a recurring role. Uh, somehow or another, that slipped through the cracks. I don't know what happened. Um, but anyway, I didn't know. But I ended up going in. I ended up doing it. And ended up booking it. Yeah. Um, I was told later on that it was it was it was a recurring role. And I, I was talking to I was talking to my buddy Malcolm. He's like, you know, this is Nichelle show. And I was like, what? And he, he was <laughs> like, yeah. And I was like, ah, this is so cool. Because again, you know, she's coming up, Malcolm's coming up, I'm coming up. Um, the first episode had uh, had a recording artist who was another friend of ours who we grew up with. Um, uh, his name is Fantastic Negrito. He's a <laughs> he's a two time a two time Grammy winner. Uh, uh, like literally last year, won his second Grammy, and um, you know he he provided the music for that that first episode. Um, who else? Uh, ben Watkins was one of the consulting producers on that. He's from the Bay Area. I did touring theater with him. Um, it was, it, oh, the show takes place in the Bay Area, yeah. it, 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 in Oakland. And so there was this whole feeling of Bay Area people doing good, but not only Bay Area people doing good, these are my friends. Yeah. You know, these are, these are my friends. These are, be, these are my friends to the point where they're my family. Yeah. And that's, you know, it always, it always warms my heart when people that I that I've been in the trenches with are getting you know a book and stuff yeah, but when I yeah. see you know the people even closer to me getting it they are you doing good and and um, and being a part of that and and I've had success in my own right also but being able to be brought into this um, is 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 a beautiful thing and I had a great time on set and obviously I, I got a chance to meet and work with Octavia and Ron Cephas Jones from This Is Us, Us Tracy Tracy Toms who's also in it yeah. um, and just it, it was just a wonderful experience wonderful time and I was renewed for season two so we'll yeah. we'll be back well and the other the other series which is a Quibi series uh, which for those of folks who watch Quibi that that's, seems really interesting I haven't watched this yet but it looks fascinating considering it's got Lawrence Fishburne and Stefan James in it who I both love but I hashtag free Ray Sean um yeah. what 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 was that like how did that come about and what was that like especially knowing it's a quibi series right well uh truth be told see what i did there uh, i did um that the work that i did on that was all adr work okay but it was all adr work for the whole for for all 15 episodes now keeping in mind all 15 episodes are like five six minutes a piece sure, sure so it's a new it's 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 kind of a, it's not really a new concept but it's a uh i guess uh Hollywood type concept now because a lot of people have done web series that are you know five or six minutes long yeah right but yeah it's it's uh it was it was ADR work which uh for a lot of people who don't know ADR work can is more or less like depending on the level of it it could be like background voice work but with residuals yeah and and it's 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 a cool gig and it's it's wonderful when you can when you can get that it's different it's it's in studio experience and it was a lot of fun to do. A lot of fun. well tell me about get gone because you've talked about this before and this was that horror film you alluded to that you were shooting in oregon yeah and um which again and another one i have not seen the, I, I see every horror film and i've still not seen get gone i feel oh, like man, i've seen every good. lynn shea film except get gone um so i need to see this and I'm just curious how this came about and how much fun was it? I imagine it's always fun to shoot a horror film. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, Michael Thomas Daniel is the writer, the creator, the writer, and the director of Get Gone. I met Michael in a uh, infomercial class that we did for a weight loss product. And uh, we just, he and I kept in touch over the years. And uh, one day he hit me up and he's like, dude, I, I wrote this script, it's a horror film. And uh, I want the lead to be a black guy. And the, the running joke is usually black people get killed within the first 10, 15 minutes of a horror film. Yeah. So, yeah. So he wanted, he wanted the lead to be, to, to be a black guy. I mean, so he wrote the part for me and my character's name is Rico. So yeah. <laughs> Ranger Rico. So, um, so yeah, he, 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 I, I accepted it. He, he gave me the lowdown in terms of what, where they were at and where they were looking to shoot it and all that. And uh, he was able to uh, get Lynn Shea uh, on board. Lin Shay from the Insidious series, from yeah. uh, uh, There's Something About Mary, and so many other different amazing projects. Uh, Robert Miano, um, two of the Coppola boys, uh, 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 Nick Cage's son, as well as his nephew. 
and uh, a host of other uh, wonderful actors from Oregon as well as here in LA. And uh, we shot in Cascade Locks, Oregon, which is a small town about 45 minutes from Portland, uh, which looks like, respectfully I say this, the scene of a horror movie. Um, <laughs> More so because of the forest and, yeah. you know, just the, just that whole type of setting. Um, the whole Twin Peaks vibe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, but cool town, really cool people, and um, it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, uh, it was three weeks of, um, of shooting, a lot of night shoots, uh, a lot of mosquito bites, uh, a lot of sleep patterns that were thrown way off. <laughs> but so much fun, man. I mean, we... Ah, man, we, we, we shot a hell of a film and just the experience of working in that genre, doing what we did and, and the honor of working with people like Lynn and, and Robert and that it was such a wonderful experience because obviously we're working, you know, we're working with pros here and, and, and people who are our mainstays in that genre. And uh, just being able to share that screen credit, chew up that scenery, it was amazing. And and we ended up winning um, a bunch of uh, awards for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I won uh, Best Supporting Actor at the uh, Action on Film Film Festival in Las Vegas. And uh, it's it's been doing very well. We got picked up by Sony and uh, for distribution. It's currently available on iTunes, I believe on Amazon Prime as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's I it, it was fun. It's it's a fun ride. It's very much. It's not along the slasher film genre. It's more in terms of like Hitchcock and and there is blood, but it's not, you know, it's not blood yeah. or guts. It's not everywhere. Exact. Yeah, yeah. It's more of a more of a mind fuck, if anything. Yeah. And uh, but but it was it was it was a labor of love with Michael Thomas Daniel and, and, you know, I'm, I'm forever grateful for him to even think of me for this project, bring me on board, fight for me to keep, to stay on board from, you know, investors and things like that. You know, a lot of the politics that sometimes come into, sure. into getting money and stuff like that, but just really believing in me and, and really, um, and, uh, also just being cool, you know, allowing me to play while I'm there and, and, and put my own input. He's very much an actor's director. So, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I encourage everybody to check it out. If you if you're a fan of Lens, if you're a fan of mine, if you're a fan of any the name Coppola or Cage or Robert Miano, definitely check it out. Uh, I'm now lately you've been uh, dipping your toes into the podcast game, um, or into the I guess it's not a podcast video podcast. How would you describe Lightning Hour? Yeah, you know I've I've, I've worded it a couple of different ways. I, I call it a a YouTube web web talk show series <laughs> kind of like this yeah yeah <laughs> kind of like this yeah pretty much pretty much yeah and you know we 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 hold our we conduct our interviews on zoom throw it up on youtube and um it's it 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 was it's been talked about for months uh rochelle henry who's one of my co-hosts uh her and i have been talking about it for months her and i have have, have uh, presented at uh, various uh uh, award shows we presented at the Young Artist Awards. That's actually where we met, and we hosted an event with uh, recording artist Cameron Mino, as well. And we just got to the point where we were just like, we work really well together. We should do something. We should maybe yeah. do something where we're, you know, dip our toes into the into the hosting arena. And um, so while we were while we were hosting Cameron Mino's show, that's that's really when the conversation started to kind of get kicked into overdrive and Sasha Kerbal who was also the other co-host uh, she jumped in and and so with the three of us we decided let's create a show and let's do this especially while we're in quarantine yeah. and everything is basically shut the hell down yeah. so we created the lightning hour uh, we tapped into people that we knew as far as guests and um We've been going great ever since. What, what's so great about our show is you have three different people with three different personalities from three totally different walks of life. Yeah. Um, I am a black man of a certain age who has lived through various uh, time periods of, of just different, my upbringing, fashion, the industry, civil rights, um, just Bef just life and Rochelle is 
is is 19 years old. She's she's Generation Z. Yeah. She's all up in that mix. Um, but she's also a writer, a director, um, uh, a producer, and 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 just just a very positive role model for for young women coming up. And then there's Sasha Kerbal, who's from Russia, yeah. uh, hasn't even been here uh, 10 years, and offers that worldly perspective and and just her own perspective growing up. And she's actually a former uh, uh, radio host and uh, back home radio uh, radio host. So. She has her her mix, and she's all she's an actress now. Rochelle's an actress. I'm an actor. So it's three actors, three different perspectives, interviewing other people from different genres of the entertainment industry. Yeah. And we've had uh, so far we've we've had um, Sheldon Reynolds of Earth, Wind, and Fire. We've had um, we've had uh, Paul Anthony from the from the group Full Force, who was a uh, group big in the '80s and the '90s, who. Uh, produced Britney Spears, Lisa Lisa Cold Jam, and, and a score of James Brown, a score of other people. Uh, we've had uh, Gloria Garayua from the hit show Reckoning, uh, Christian uh, Hutchison, Hutchison from uh, the hit show Dark Netflix, um, and, and a whole variety of other people as well. We have, and, and we've already completed our first season. We're actually in our second season right now. And uh, we have some really fun, amazing guests. And um, yeah, man, we're just, you know, we're, we're off and running while still pursuing our acting career and, and doing that. One of the greatest things about this industry is the fact that we can dip our toes into so many different genres. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that you, during COVID, there was all of the, like, you know, it's like you look on Instagram and there's nothing but people doing interviews and, and people just talking to people and connecting with people. And so we're taking that to the next level, creating the lightning hour, creating a, a specific format, a script, and just having fun throughout as we go. And it's it's been great. I mean, the fact that we're on our second season and we've had the guests that we've had, it's it's been it's been it's been awesome, man. And and I can't say enough about my co-hosts and just it's been beautiful, man. It's been That's beautiful. Awesome. So I, I encourage people to please check out the lightning hour please go subscribe to us on youtube and uh follow us on instagram and and enjoy the uh we had tj storm godzilla who's currently godzilla yeah. on on our show man i mean it's it's oh and man, you ugh, the guests that we got coming up is gonna be sick sick well, there you go. <laughs> well rico i'm gonna end this chat the way i end every chat by asking you to tell me out of all of your performances of the projects you've done, what is the one that you wish more people knew about? Uh -huh. um, gosh. I'm going to answer that question in two ways. Um, I wish more people knew about Star Trek Renegades. Yeah. Um, it it was it was a wonderful independent project that was that 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 wasn't just a labor of love but it was a labor it was a love of star trek it was a love of wanting to continue something that continued to be big um even though there was nothing happening um from star trek actors it was a labor of love and a love letter to the fans who maybe you liked it, maybe you didn't, but guess what? It's new Trek and yeah. it's, it's cool. And fandom is a huge thing. Fans, they know what they like. They know what they don't like. They may not always be right. I got my personal feelings about, you know, people who don't like Star Trek because of this reason and that reason. And that's okay. I always say, just enjoy Star Trek, you know? Um, so that's one because there's so many different versions of it. Um, I would say another one is Get Gone because it 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 was at one point the the the, the little train that could, and and it it got made and it was it was a dream project of Michael's and and he got it done and it was you know it's it's, it's that age old testament of if you put your mind to it uh, you can do anything. I think that came from Back to the Future. So <laughs> right. yeah, so. But, but it's true, it's true. You know, it, hard work, persistence pays off and all, all those wonderful puns or, or, or sayings and stuff like that. Um, I want people to, to watch it, enjoy it, take it in. Um, but for both projects, just recognize that this is art. This is people's art. 
and this is and 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 art should always be respected. I don't care that you have your personal thoughts and feelings about the stuff. Understand that these are people's arts, people's art, and it, people don't do art for the sake of just doing it. People don't do art because they want to ruin a franchise. People don't want to don't do art because they want to just screw everything up or whatever you know you, you read a lot of stuff but um people do art because they have a vision and they have a thought that they want to get out there and um these two projects meant a lot to me because of the independent factor and because of the fact that uh it went from an idea to an to an execution and i'm saying this from all the other shows that i've done and i'm by the end of this interview i'm probably going to think oh man i should have thought brought that one up too but right now, that the, these are the two projects that come to mind because I started out my career doing a lot of independent work, yeah. uh, a lot of in, independent film, a lot of independent theater. So I have a I have an immense love for independent projects that that come from from the heart and come from a place of I don't know from a from a place of just just original creativity that a lot of people may not put a whole lot of stock into. Uh, because they don't know it. They, they don't know it like they know Star Wars. They don't know it like they know, you know, different yeah, things like that. So that's the long form answer to that question. I think that's a, I think that's a lovely, lovely final answer. Um, Thank you. I appreciate you sitting down and chatting with us, sir. Um, I'm going to do a couple of quick pimping uh, things for Scripps Gone Wild coming up because when this drops, uh, our next read will be Flight of the Navigator on the 23rd. Um, which is an exciting one. We've got the lead from that film, Joey Kramer, who was like 12 when he made that movie. He's an adult now, and he's reading the Max role. It's also his birthday that day. Uh, it's going to be on a Sunday, which is not our usual night, but we're doing it because it's his birthday, and we thought that would be a fun way to celebrate that. And then on the 26th, we have Fright Night, which is hosted by our buddy Frank Dietz. And, um, and that's what's coming up now. You can follow us at, at Scripps Gone Wild across all social media, ScriptsGoneWild.com, Patreon.com slash Scripps Gone Wild. Where can folks find you, Rico? They can find me on Instagram at I am Rico Anderson. Same handle on Twitter. And I believe just punch in my name, Rico Anderson, on Facebook. I have two pages there. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for sitting down with us, sir. Billy Ray, can I do one more quick plug? Hell yeah. All right. I 10 years ago, I did a play called The Ballad of Emmett Till. Okay. It is the story of Emmett Till. Oh. And uh, for people who don't know, Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy who went to um, uh, Money, Mississippi to visit his uh, uncle for the summer. He was tortured and murdered brutally for supposedly whistling at a white woman. Yeah. He actually, um, he actually had a stutter and he was taught when you when you get to the point where you're stuttering too much, whistle so you can kind of smooth it out. Yeah. The story goes that happened when he and his cousins were at uh, at a at a basically a store buying candy, and then everything went down after that. Um, this is a wonderful piece written by Ifa Baeza, yeah. and uh, we did this ten years ago at the Fountain Theater, and uh, we are reviving this. Uh, for uh, for an online performance that we're going to be doing, and it's 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 going to be with the Fountain Theater. Tickets are twenty dollars. Um, I encourage everybody to please um, uh, watch it. Yeah. it. It is actually, in some people's cases, the beginning of the civil rights movement, which even Rosa Parks thought of Emmett Till at the time when she was feeling like I'm not going to get up from this bus. Yeah, and so. It, we won, we were the show to beat that year. And we won, you know, we won all the awards, including the Ovation Awards, which is like the biggest award here in, in Southern California. But beyond that, it's a wonderful historical piece. Um, it's a very abstract piece. Um, it's told from the mind of Emmett Till. It's, it's, it's got so many different layers. And it's not just us looking at, looking ahead and saying lines. There's a lot more that's gonna be uh, happening with it. And I'm very excited to return to it. I'm, I, I was beyond honored to be asked back. I am part of the original cast. And um, and uh, it's directed by Shirley Jo Finney. Yeah. And, um, yeah, anyway, I encourage people to please go to fountaintheater.com and, uh, and purchase tickets. It's gonna be an amazing, an amazing experience. And, and on the top of that, please support your local theaters because live theater is taking one of the biggest hits ever because it's all shut down because of COVID. And so 
these these shows are very important to maintain the theater company as it is today until this you know until we get you know we're able to get back to uh get yeah. back to certain things, um, things no like that. that sounds that sounds awesome i'll be definitely be checking that out please please it's it's wonderful it's it's yeah. there you go so well thank you sir i appreciate you and uh, i'll see you at the next read great talking to you billy ray thanks so much for having me man thanks buddy